Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. And at question number one, I call Colette Stevenson. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the read write count with the First Minister programme. Minister Graham Day. Thank you, President Officer. The read write count with the First Minister programme is an important part of the Scottish Government's commitment to raising attainment by building parents' confidence and encouraging families to include reading, writing, and counting activities in their everyday lives. The programme provides literacy and numeracy materials to pupils in primaries two and three, and last year 248,000 books were provided to children across Scotland. The Government is currently working with the Scottish Book Trust to finalise arrangements for the provision of materials in 2024. Colette Stevenson. I thank the Minister for that response. East Kilbride has more than 20 recognised reading schools, inclu including the Gold Accredited St Andrews and St Bride's High. Initiatives like this and Read Right Count are helping attainment by building parents' confidence and supplying books and activities for children. However, while the Scottish Government does this good work, Labour run South Lanarkshire Council are threatening to close Greenhills Library and Community Hall widely used by reading groups and toddler groups. In my view, this would potentially increase the poverty-related attainment gap. Does the Minister share my concerns and those of the 1,700 locals that have signed a petition against it that the Labour-run Council's proposals will be bad for the community? And can he reiterate the benefits of the Scottish Government's budget to South Lanarkshire Council? Minister. So, officer, I, I do understand the member's concerns and those of her constituents as she's articulated, because library services are a vital and valued community resource. In relation to the uh, budget uh, question, in 2024-25, South Lanarkshire Council will receive £742.7 million to fund local services, which equates to an extra £45.9 million to support vital day-to-day -day provision, or an additional 6.6 per cent compared to 23 24. So whilst these are ultimately decisions for the Council to take, this Government is providing a fair funding settlement despite the cuts to our budget. Question number two, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact of the £58.7 million reduction to the College operational expenditure budget for 2024-25 on the Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire constituency. Minister Graham Day. Presenting the Scottish Budget allocates funding to the college sector as a whole. Indicative funding allocations for colleges are expected to be set out by the SFC in spring 2024, as is normally the case. Once allocations are published, uh, uh, each college will know its position and therefore be able to consider any impact. Although I know individual colleges are already working on projections based on a working assumption of flat cash or a slight reduction. The SFC is endeavouring to deliver a core teaching funding allocation that is as close as possible to core teaching funding colleges received in 2023-24. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that answer. Colleges like Borders College in my constituency play a vital role to communities by upskilling future generations. As a direct result of these resource spending cuts, students will now see their learning opportunities diminish. Colleges will have to make tough choices about what subjects they can offer, which staff to keep and, crucially, how many students they can offer places to. The Minister can make all the excuses he wants, but it is clear that the SNP have either forgotten about the importance of colleges or they just don't care about them. Minister, which one is it? Minister. Well, the usual crocodile tears for the Tories, because let's not forget where the budget problems are coming from, Westminster. Um, President Officer, we are involved in detailed, direct discussions with the colleges about their future, uh, future budgets and the impacts of those, uh, as are the SFC. And I, I do say to the member, there is detailed engagement with the colleges about the long-term future uh, through the reform agenda to try and ensure that not only does the future provision meet the needs of employers, the economy and learners at a national level, but also more local, uh, locally. And that we take account of the fact that delivering in areas such as the borders can come at a greater cost than other parts of the country. So there's a considerable amount of work going on here directly with colleges. Let's keep our questions and answers concise, please. I call Emma Harper. 
Thank you, President Officer. Despite a challenge and a difficult financial climate created by irresponsible and reckless Conservative fiscal policy, I welcome that the Scottish Government has increased investment in education and skills budget by £128 million. So in respect of college budgets, can the Minister share how the starting position for 2024-25 compares to the end position for 2023-24? Minister. Well, as, as I think I said a moment ago, President Officer, the aim here is that the funds available to colleges at the start of 24-25 financial year will be very similar to the funds that were actually invested in the colleges in the current financial year. And that's despite an incredibly challenging financial set of circumstances. We're doing everything we can to support our colleges and universities, recognising the extraordinary impact they have on our economy and society and the pivotal future uh, roles that we see for them both. Question number three, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the operations of the Parole Board for Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. President Officer, I recognise the critical role of the Parole Board for Scotland and the role it plays in our justice system. The Scottish Government it works with the Independent Parole Board for Scotland in support of its statutory functions. That includes, for example, reviewing and updating the Parole Board rules to ensure that they remain fit for purpose. Those rules were updated in 2021 and 2022. There are no current plans for a further review of the rules at this stage, um, but I do keep this under close and careful consideration. And as the member will appreciate, decisions by the Parole Board in the exercise of its statutory functions are independent of Scottish Ministers. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, this Parliament recently updated the rules for the Parole Board including giving victims certain rights which dictate what the parole board must do. But the parliament also gave the board wider powers that they could use. Is the, minister, is the cabinet secretary sorry, content that the board is doing everything that it can uh, possibly do for victims rather than limiting itself to what it must do? Cabinet secretary. President Officer, it is critical that the views of victims are heard at all stages in the justice system, and that includes parole. It, no part of the justice system is beyond scrutiny or challenge, it, particularly when it comes to what more we can do to support victims. As highlighted, the parole board rules were updated in 2021 and 2022, and this means that victims or family members of victims can apply to the Parole Board of Scotland to observe hearings. This, of course, is a matter for the, the legal chair, but the legal chair has facilitated this uh, on many occasions. And this also builds on the existing rights of victims to make representations uh, in writing or verbally uh, to members of the Parole Board before uh, decisions are made. And of course, there's the, the valuable work undertaken by the victims team that sits within uh, Parole Scotland. And I'm conscious that I have outstanding correspondence uh, to the member in relation to victims' rights vis-a-vis those wider powers that he references. Question number four, Stephen Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of its current relationship with local authorities. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government recognises the value that local government contributes to delivering vital services across the country. Since the signing of the Verity House Agreement in June last year, good progress has been made, and there are a number of positive examples of collaborative working between central and local government. Through my monthly relationship meetings with the COSLA presidential team, we jointly review the progress on our collaborative working on an ongoing basis. First Minister and Deputy First Minister met with the COSLA presidential team last week to discuss the importance of our relationships, and the DFM and I met with COSLA political leaders just yesterday. Stephen Kerr. Well, that was a, an optimistic response from the Minister, because everybody knows the Verity House Agreement is dead in the water. We, we all saw, we've all seen the letter from the Deputy First Minister that was sent sometime yesterday, true to form, it was leaked to the Daily Record. Uh, so much then for their full funded council tax freeze. If she thinks, if he thinks, and if the Deputy First Minister thinks that this shows a functioning, working relationship between the SNP government and local government, she is mistaken. Some councils are setting their budgets today, some set them last week. Does he not agree 
that by the chaos that his government has created through the Scottish Government budget process, Members. he and the rest of the government have shown their complete disdain for local democracy. Minister. No, no, I don't, and I'm, I'm surprised by the, the, the member's question around the council tax freeze because I thought the Conservatives supported the council tax freeze. Uh, I certainly know that, 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 that it's the people of Scotland support the council tax freeze. The Scottish Government believes that at a time when rising prices are putting significant strain on household finances, not largely caused by the actions of his UK Government, the freeze will give some certainty Members. to households over the coming years. And I think it's really important to, members to, to remember that as a proportion of income, council taxpayers on the lowest incomes will benefit the most from the council tax freeze. And when taken alongside our income tax policies, it is independently recognised as being progressive. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. In, in an attempt to repair the, rela the damaged relationship um, with local government, it's been reported, as Mr Kerr says, that the Cabinet Secretary has offered to res restore the £63 million previously cut from council budgets. Can I ask the Minister if that funding restoration is also dependent on councils agreeing the council tax freeze? The, the, Minister. The, the Deputy First Minister previously indicated that subject to the, um, the UK budget next week, there will be £45 million of consequentials um, coming from um, the, the, the UK Government's decision to give some additional very ring-fenced funding to local government there. And the Deputy First Minister has announced that she wants to increase that to the, the full nearly £63 million. The big challenge is to make sure that money is real. So I call on colleagues across the chamber to, to demand that the UK Chancellor make sure that the budget on the 6th of March is a budget that protects services and does not give more tax cuts to the wealthy. Question number five, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that railway infrastructure is safe and fit for the future. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Safety of the railway is a key priority for Scottish Ministers, though it is ultimately a matter reserved to the UK Government. The independent rail regulator, the ORR, is responsible for ensuring Network Rail meets its safety responsibilities and determines the appropriate funding. The Scottish Government has fully funded Network Rail Scotland in line with the ORR's recommendations and is investing record sums in rail with total funding for the rail sector in Scotland of £1.6 billion in 2024-25. This compares to pre-pandemic levels of some £0.9 billion to £1 billion. Paul Sweeney. Thank the Minister for that response. Springburn Railway Station does not offer step-free access, making it inaccessible for wheelchair users. The Scottish Government must do all within its gift to ensure equal access to Scotland's railway. So will the Minister make representation to the Department for Transport to press for access for all scheme funding for control period 7 so that much-needed improvements can be made at last to Springburn Railway Station? I understand the member has just written to me. I think I've just replied, or it may be a question, uh, as he recognised this is an accessibility uh, programme and funding that he has alluded to is the responsibility of the UK Government. But I, like him, will make sure my discussions uh, with both Network Rail and the ORR and the others to make sure that accessibility is a key priority. Indeed, um, I'm just leaving this uh, session in Parliament this afternoon to have a meeting with mobility and access groups. Brief supplementary, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. A train derailment on the Aberdeen to Dundee line at Carmont in 2020 tragically saw the three lives lost. So can I ask the Minister to outline what work has been done to improve safety and resilience on the Aberdeen to Dundee line? Cabinet Secretary. Our thoughts remain first and foremost with all those affected by that tragic accident at Carmont. While rail, safe, rail safety, as I've said, is reserved to the UK Government, the Scottish Ministers are committed to doing everything we can to help prevent accidents and ensure that passengers travel safely on our rail network. Network Rail, which has overall responsibility for the network, is addressing the infrastructure recommendations set out in the Rail Accident Investigation Branches report, which followed this tragic derail derailment 
For example, there is better management of civil engineering construction activities by Network Rail and its contractors. There is improved operational responses to extreme rainfall um, events, utilising the fuel, fuel cap capability of modern technology and based on a detailed understanding of the risk associated with extreme rain rainfall as well as other matters. And we are fully funding, as I said, that maintenance and future proofing as set out in my previous answer. Liam Kerr. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. The Class 43 high-speed trains were, in the report into Carment, partially thought to be responsible for the consequences. Transport Minister, when will the Class 43 be replaced? Cabinet Secretary. So the, uh, the, the question of infrastructure covers obviously the infrastructure on the network and then the member is referring to the fleet itself. Uh, I would refer the member to the reports into Carmen in relation to the fleet itself. I've had discussions with the unions and indeed with ScotRail in terms of the, the future provision. Um, as you might be aware, uh, we are looking very carefully at uh, the timing and when in relation to other matters that those, that fleet would be replaced. Question number six, Ash Regan. To ask the Scottish Government, as part of its work to further the case for Scottish independence, and in light of the Supreme Court ruling that the Scottish Parliament cannot legislate for a referendum on Scottish independence, the reason for its position that there should not be a referendum at this stage on the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Minister Jamie Hepburn. In line with the mandate secured democratically at the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, the Scottish Government wants to hold a referendum on Scottish independence that would lead to Scottish independence rather than a referendum on the powers of the Scottish Parliament short of that. For this reason, at this stage, we do not plan to hold such a referendum, where any proposal for such emerges will give it proper consideration. Through our building a new Scotland series of prospectus papers, we continue to set out the positive case for independence as an alternative to the broken Brexit Britain now in recession, supported by the Tories, Labour and Liberal Democrats. Ash Regan. This will be 10 years since the independence referendum, 10 years of a majority government. With respect, Minister, papers can be produced by anyone. What the independence movement wants at this point is action. Time is of the essence, and the government should embrace the opportunity to give Scots the power to tell the world that they want the Scottish Parliament to negotiate for and legislate for independence. And if they don't, this entire five-year parliamentary term will have been wasted. Perhaps the Minister can enlighten us. What is the point of a pro-independence majority if it is not used to pursue independence? Minister. Well, of course, that's exactly what we're doing. And with respect to Ms Reagan, I have Members. literally just said, and we don't even have a draft proposal with the consequential consultation that would come, let alone a final proposal before this Parliament. But I have said, if that emerges, we'll give it full consideration. But, of course, the manifesto, which I stood on, which she stood on as well, said that uh, we should have a referendum. We have that mandate. That should be irrespective. But also set out that we take forward the work that we're taking through the Building a New Scotland series of prospectus papers. I've brought four debates to this chamber on uh, the Bans paper on the written constitution, the 27th of June last year, on migration of 14th of November last year, on Scotland's place in the EU, 30th of January this year, on social security on the 20th of February this year. I know the member hasn't been able to take part in any of those debates yet, but the good news is she and all members of this place will have the opportunity to do so in the future because we're going to continue taking forward that work. Question number seven, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the First Minister's reported comments, that it is, quote, has to go further to ensure that plans to radically reform how young people are cared for in Scotland are realised, whether it has identified what steps it will take to achieve this. Minister Natalie Don. The Scottish Government is clear in our commitment to keep the promise, and we've made really good progress, but of course there's always further that we can go. Action is underway across ministerial portfolios, including progress to stage three of the Children's Care and Justice Bill, engagement on our commitment to a £2,000 care lever payment, and investment in prevention through whole family wellbeing. In the last year, I've seen many great examples of transformational activity across Scotland in education, justice, and children's services. And I've been clear that where it is required, I want to see that best practice shared and replicated across Scotland. 
In terms of moving forward, the Scottish Government will publish a review of our promised implementation plan this spring to update on the actions and commitments underway. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful for that response. And last Friday was, of course, Care Day, the biggest celebration of care-experienced children around the world. But Who Cares Scotland's recent report um, highlights at least amber, if not red, with some of the things that we're trying to achieve. An absence rate of 83% among social workers in one local authority. Concerns about restraint, concerns about informal school exclusions, concerns about data. So Scotland will keep the promise, but when will Scotland see the illuminated path to actually achieving it in the time that we have promised? Minister. Well, I thank the member for that question. And equally, I am thankful for the Who Cares Scotland report, which highlighted those areas where further work is required. We are absolutely determined to drive forward the transformational change required to keep the promise. And I fully believe that the actions this government has, are and will take will help us to achieve that. As well as the areas I have already mentioned, and specifically in relation to Mr Whitfield's points, we are seeing clear progress across a number of areas, such as the increase in the numbers of virtual head teachers across Scotland, a model that is showing real progress in reducing exclusions. We have had the publication of the Hearings for Children redesign report, and the member, I am sure, will be aware of the government response to that. And in terms of data, we have seen progress, but I am willing to um, discuss any areas of concern with the member. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes general questions. Before we move to First Minister's questions, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery Hannah Neighbour, President of the State Parliament of Lower Saxony.